Eight o'clock Sunday night live. My name is Paul Palmer with Patriots of Christ. And we'll just sit here a little bit and see if we build up a little bit of an audience tonight and see who's out there. We try to be on time the best that we can. My precious brother, Bobby Chisholm, out of Jennings, Oklahoma. Thank you, Bobby, for being here on this wonderful Sunday evening. Glad you had a great day at church today. Sounds like you had a wonderful time. Brother Scott Elston up there in Guthrie, Oklahoma, regional leader for the Oklahoma City region, and uh, along with Phil Pitts and some other great men in Oklahoma City. So, uh, yeah, you too. You too, Bobby. And uh, so, uh, evening, Brother Scott. So uh, let's just sit here and wait just a little bit. Not that I'm just buying time, but let's give the guys a couple of minutes here, maybe about 30 seconds or so. But it's an important night. This is an important subject. You know, many of the guys have uh, heard me say time and time again when Patriots of Christ was started that God said to me in this very office, he said, Paul, I'm stirring the hearts of the men of this nation. And uh, so that's one of the things we need to talk about, not about the stirring, because he said, I am. You know, that, that's something that, that he's doing, okay? But he said he's stirring the hearts, and uh, those hearts reside in us. Those are our spirits. And so I've told a lot of people, and you see some of the, uh, the uh, typing up there in the header, I've been known to say many times, if you want a greater walk with God, then really what you need to do is make your heart better. And I'll refer to that after a while. You know, that, that sounds easy. A lot of things sound easy when you say them. But in reality, uh, anything that's worth having takes diligence, work, and effort, and consciousness on the part of the person that is wanting to achieve something. So, Brother Lanny Armstrong, Tulsa region. Thank God for Lanny Armstrong, knife maker, American Airlines, deer hunter. Oh, my goodness. It's deer season, and Lanny is excited. Well, it looks like we've got some more out there. <clears throat> some of you guys are signing in. Looks like we've got some viewing over here in the left-hand corner. So that's good. That's good. So uh, let's just take off tonight and jump right into this, and let's use the most out of our time and God's time and get right to uh, the heart <laughs> of the matter. How about that? Father, we thank you for everybody that's on the broadcast tonight. I ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts, our eyes, and our ears to understand what it is that the Spirit of God is wanting to say to us to have a greater walk with our Heavenly Father. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you that by your precious life and your precious blood that you purchased each one of us so that we could come together on a night like this. And I thank you, Lord. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're going to start off tonight into a subject that I think uh, is of utmost importance to every Christian, probably one of the most important subjects that we'll ever discuss. And uh, it's also uh, really important to those that understand the workings of the kingdom of God to help them be able to uh, move in that kingdom in a greater way. I'll probably be moving around and scrolling down as you guys are talking and stuff. I don't want to miss comments and stuff like that. So. Anyway, but it's also unfortunate <clears throat> that the majority of the Christians in our part of the world uh, leave this work undone, uh, totally undone uh, in their daily lives. And so that's really, really unfortunate. It also tells you that we need to uh, take this subject up and get something about it. I mean, done about it. Uh, how can I say this? I was I was fortunate. Uh, God put me into this subject for three years. And I know that's a long time you think on one scripture or one truth, but he just put me in it for three years and left me there. So the old saying goes, <laughs> it bears repeating, guys, you can't give 
what you don't have. So as much as he left me in there, I want to introduce you tonight and also build on the next two or three Sunday nights on a subject that I have called guarding your heart. And so hopefully that, uh, you know, if you can get some uh, wives around there or kids around there and hey, brother Robert Tricky, looks like you are on tonight in Tulsa and uh, you are coming to us as Patriots of Christ. So I think you've gotten in and logged in. Thank you, Jesus. So I think the best way to do this is to open up with a question. So here's the question. What do you think that you came into this world to do? Or we can say it another way. What major activity should be your basic priority? The one that demands all your attention, all your energy, all your strength uh, in the brief life that you have down here on this planet created by our Heavenly Father that we call Earth. What, what would that be? Should it be to spend all of our time uh, in strength and a pursuit of our employment, uh, success, uh, worldly success, uh, chasing after uh, pleasures, seeing how many things we can enjoy, how much uh, possessions we can gather up, uh, how many accolades we can, hey, Paul, glad you're here tonight, we can lay up for ourselves, how far we can push the envelope in the sight of men's eyes. Is that, uh, you know, so we can make ourselves feel good about ourselves and what we've accomplished. Uh, we can make ourselves feel good in our own minds that, hey, we did something, uh, we made a contribution. And uh, so is that is that what our, our whole life should be spent doing? I want you to listen to this guy. I read a lot of his stuff. I used to read a lot of stuff out of the 16th century. And this guy named John Owens was a, a Puritan preacher in the 1670s. Here's what he had to say about that. I want you to listen into this. He said, we came into this world under one law, and that is, and it's Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 for anybody who's taking notes out there tonight. It says, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. And he goes on to say, so the end purpose of our lives while we're here is that uh, it may be prepared for that judgment. And if that is neglected, if the principal part of our time is not improved with respect to the end purpose, then are we going to fall under the sentence of, of that to eternity? And you know, that, that's a fair question. That's a very fair question. But here's some of my thoughts and ponderings, and, and most of them come, let me scroll down, when uh, uh, I lived and running a business in Oklahoma City, my chair is sinking here. Let me put it back up. Shock's about worn out. But there's been many times over the years that I've just looked at all the traffic when I was hauling trailer and stuff and working around Oklahoma City, and I see all the people going back and forth and to and fro, and I've wondered how many times in their busy days, how many of them are really pressing towards that high calling and the prize that we find in Jesus Christ, uh, you know, in their busy everyday lives, you know? You can find a few folks today, it seems like, who want to talk about salvation, but you won't find very many. You even find fewer that are actually enjoying the joy and manifesting that joy of that salvation in their lives. In other words, today we have, guys, a lot of form of godliness, but, de but most of it denies the power of God. And we see this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. So I'll be reading scripture tonight quite a bit, more so than what I usually do. But it says there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, I've experienced that one a number of times, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. We see that manifesting big time. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, 
having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And, and he goes on to say, from such turn away. It goes on to verse 7 to say, every, er, they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Listen, that pretty much sums up the day and times that we're living in. In our days, it seems that it's a rare thing to find someone who knows from experience the power that separates from the world or delivers them from themselves or defends them from Satan. I don't know how many times I hear people, even in church, oh, pray for me, Brother Paul. Satan's after me. Satan's after me. Oh, bless his holy name, right? Anywhere, defends him from Satan, makes sin to be hated, Christ to be loved, the truth to be valued and prized, and to make error and evil to be departed from. You know, it seems like it's a very rare situation or very rare occasion. We find people like that anymore. So where do you go to find men? that are denying themselves and taking up their cross every day and following Christ in the path of obedience. Matthew chapter 6 says this. Jesus said this unto his disciples. He said, uh, if any man, you know, that, that qualifies us, guys, right there. Any man. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. You know, to deny yourself all these other things and to follow Christ, you have to let yourself do that. He didn't say, I'll make you do that. He said, let him. So you have to let. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So where are they today? Who's rejoicing in reproach, welcoming shame, enduring persecution for the cause of Christ? Where are they who's really getting prayers answered every day on whose behalf God is showing himself strong? You know, if we don't see that, Every day, if we don't see that in our lives ongoing, let me scroll down. Somebody else may be here. Atlanta said, amen. Then we got to say this, guys. If we're not seeing that, then something's wrong. And I'm not trying to be over animated tonight. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point. I was out on the porch today asking, Lord, help me tonight because this is so important. But that's the truth, guys. If, if we aren't seeing those things, hey, Brother Benjamin, glad you're here then something is wrong somewhere. Listen to this. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verses 9, declares this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Now listen to me. Don't let that word perfect throw you for a loop, okay? It means uh, to be complete, safe, peaceful, whole, full, at peace. It relays the thought of a covenant peace in here and in your mind with God. It doesn't mean that you're some perfect person. It means that you've been made whole by the blood of Jesus Christ and by his, Christ, by his grace, you've been made right. But here's what I want to get at in that scripture for the eyes of the Lord, see? So you see the very opening words in that scripture tells us that those with a perfect heart are very far and few between because the scripture tells us that God has to search. He, ha he has to search and go through the whole earth, guys. So if we're not seeing these things, something's wrong. Somebody has to take a deep dive here. Somebody has to ask the big questions. And if we want a greater walk with God, what do we need to do, Father? King David said it this way in Psalm 12. He said, help, Lord. For the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. That was King David. Paul said this to the, uh, the church in Philippi in chapter 2. He said, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. And then he said again in 2 Timothy to Timothy, he said, all they which are in Asia have turned away from me, Brother Timothy. So, you know, things aren't really any better today. But instead of talking about the negative side and the abandonment of Christianity and the abandonment of following after Christ, instead of being occupied, you know, with all the things around us, the big question is, what about our hearts? That's what we need to ask. Is your heart perfect towards God tonight? I have to ask myself that question every day. Is my heart 
perfect uh, towards you, Heavenly Father. What is, is am I am I okay here? So, if it is, then here's the point. Even in these turbulent times, even in these violent times, even in these troublesome times and signs and wonders in the earth, with everything that's going on, then God is still showing himself. Hey, Brother Dave, glad you could join us. God is still showing himself strong on your behalf. Prayers are being answered on a daily basis. Things are happening in my house, in your house, because we are walking with God and we are one with him as Christ was, and we'll point out a scripture on that. And, you know, things are happening more so than those that are empty. But if God isn't doing that, then our hearts aren't perfect towards him. And it's time for us really, quite frankly, to take an honest look at ourselves because there's nothing wrong with our heavenly father. There never will be anything wrong with him. Listen to this. Here's another question. And, and I got three points here. I've studied this. So why does our heavenly father place so much importance on the heart issue? And from my studies and after three years, I found there's three major things. Number one, if you want to write these things down, the Bible declares that he comes to make his home with us by indwelling through the presence of his spirit inside our spirits or our heart. John 17 says, and I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. You know, we only say one thing about the love thing. Do you know, your heavenly father loves you with the same love that he loved Jesus Christ. He did not love Jesus Christ any more than he loves you. Jesus said it right there. With the same love that you had for me, Father, that you love them and I'll be in them. So he's inside and indwelling you. He's inside your heart. And, and 2 Corinthians says this in chapter 6, verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you know you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the first most important thing uh, is that God indwells us. So we need to understand his presence is inside here. It's not outside. It's inside here. Number two, that's where God's kingdom is located. It says in chapter Luke, I mean, <laughs> Luke chapter 17, it says uh, when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. This is Jesus. He said, the kingdom of God cometh uh, not with observation, not outside. Neither shall they say, lo, here's the kingdom or lo, over there, there's the kingdom. He said, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Man, the kingdom of God is in us. He's deposited the kingdom with his three supernatural substances, and we'll talk about that on some other time, how to activate them, how to walk in them, how to, how to, how to understand them. But we got to understand this heart issue first. But the kingdom of God is deposited within your heart. And then number three, it is the heart of men that God looks at. You know, he said in Samuel when when Samuel went to anoint uh, King David and he was anointing all his brothers and God said, no, no, no. He said this to him, to Samuel. He said, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I've refused him. You know, we can talk there a long time because a lot of times, a lot of things look good. A lot of things sound good. You know, we can be drawn to him. But that's not the way God looks, guys. He said, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So God bypasses everything on the outside or what I call our exterior Christianity. He looks straight down on the inside of the real man and the condition of our hearts. So those are the three main reasons. Very important 
to understand how important this is to him. So here's our golden scripture that we're going to start this study off with. And it's found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. And it says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, the issues of life, or our life, don't come out of our situations. The issues of our life don't come out of our circumstances. The issues of our life don't come out of politics or what's going on in the world scene. No, the issues of our life come out of our heart. And so if you begin to understand that, you'll also begin to understand that a lot of the momentum and activity that's being done today in organized religion are many times lost labor and are keeping the people busy, just like the Pharisees of old. Jesus said this in Matthew 23. Here's what he said to him, guys. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. He said, judgment, mercy, and faith. He said, these ought you have done and not to left the others undone. So we can say it this way. Many people have a zeal for the things of God. But much of it's not according to knowledge. And they may be active. You may, I, you know, I did this one time. I did all kinds of things. And their energies might be misdirected. And they may be doing uh, many wonderful things. But Matthew 7 and verse 22 says this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. In all these years, that scripture has all, more than any scripture, that scripture has bothered me more than any scripture that I've come across in the book. And most likely he said that because what they were doing, the Pharisees he was talking to, remember basic Bible interpretation of who's talking, uh, who's he talking to, and what are they talking about. But he was telling them most likely what they were doing was self-selected, and man appointed, while the one most important thing which God assigned was neglected and unattended. So all of our outward actions, or what I call exterior Christianity, is worthless, guys, if our heart is neglected and not directed. That would mean that our hearts aren't right with God if he's not directing those actions. Doing things that are self-selected, or man appointed may not appear bad on the outside, but if they are not God directed, then the motivations of the heart can be corrupted and motivated by iniquity, such as uh, trouble, wickedness, pride, sorrow, idolatry, guilt. You can do things out of guilt, you know, and that's not right. So uh, the word of God says this in Psalm 66, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In other words, he won't hear our prayers. I know that's a big one, but we might as well just put it right out on the table. If we regard iniquity in our hearts, he says he won't hear us. So we're going to close with talking about a good conscience tonight. And I know we're going long, but guys, this is worth understanding. So let's close by talking about a good conscience. Again, I'm going to say our golden text is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Remember, it says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Diligence means, guys, there's no day off. There's no day off. To keep means to guard, to watch, watch over, or keep. Just the same word that he told him to keep in the garden. Same, same word to guard from dangers, to preserve, to be kept close, or even to be blockaded. You know, uh, you know, in the gardens back in the old days, sometimes they would build a, a, what you call a blockade or a fence around it. They still do this today in gardens. A lot of times they'll build fences to keep things safe. It means to have your conscience exercised about all things that pertain to life. In the Bible, the words heart and conscience are uh, interchangeable. They mean the same thing. Paul declared this in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. He said, and here I, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void 
of offense toward God and toward men. Now, he didn't say just God. I'm going to guard my heart and not be offended towards God, he said, but I'm not going to be offended with men. So he gives us an example that, that we can imitate, and we must be careful and diligent. In other words, like I said, no off days in working to keep our conscience free from all offenses. Let me say this. Uh, I don't think we'll ever perfectly attain it in this life, but I feel I can say this with all confidence that every man of God that has been really, truly born again has this uh, concern about their conscience. Guys, it's okay when you do something to ask God about your motivations, to make sure that your motivations are correct. Nothing wrong with that. Remember where he is? He's in your heart. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18 says this, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. You see, a good conscience in all things and willing to live honestly is worth more than gold and it's worth more than silver, man. It's just not an empty promise that doesn't get you anything. If we begin to get our hearts right with God, hearts right with all men, all kinds of things will begin to happen. You can't even put a price on something like that. You can't put a price on what the Spirit of God will do in your life when you're working on getting a better walk with God and a better heart towards him. You can't even measure the speed in which things happen in the spirit. There's no human or no device that can even measure the speed at which God does things. So this is very, very important to know. Look back at Acts chapter 24, verse 16. Paul said this. He said, herein do I exercise myself. So this is a matter he applied every day to his life. It was very important to him that, that his conscience didn't flatter him, deceive him, or mislead him. He guarded both his outer life, his inner life, so that his conscience wouldn't accuse him or condemn him. How many have ever felt guilt? How many conscious ever accused you of doing something wrong or condemned you because you messed up? You can't let that stuff build up. I'm telling you. Paul was probably more careful not to offend his conscience than he was than his closest friends because he knew the power and where God lived. He knew that he was just a temple, a dwelling place for the spirit of the living God. So he stayed away from things that he knew he didn't need to be around uh, or, or, or would tempt him to do things that he didn't want to do. He talks about the two laws of the mind, the laws of the spirit. He talks about those laws. But he also made himself do things that his natural man didn't want to do, that was right to do in the sight of God. So, you know, he was conscious of his heart. And I want to say this about guilt, because guilt is doing a number on the world, guys. You cannot allow guilt to accumulate in your heart. And when you allow guilt to accumulate, it's only going to be a matter of time before you begin to start bear the fruit of that guilt in your life. You got to get rid of it. You got to get your heart right. I put it this way. Carrying guilt is the breeding ground for condemnation. And if that settles in, that it causes you to lead a powerless life. That's how deadly guilt is. That's how deadly condemnation is. You cannot allow your heart and conscience to get to a point where it's condemning you or walking around with guilt. And the reason is because true spiritual love for God, true spiritual love for mankind can only come out of a pure heart. It's something you can't manufacture. Romans chapter 8 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, and it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So a pure heart is also going to deliver you from the hatred of man. And we see this that uh, in Titus, let me find it, in verse, uh, no, chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. And we're winding down. 
For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, deserving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So you see, spiritual love can only come out of a good conscience, one that's been made tender and active by the grace of God, purged by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then after that, it stays away from anything that will defile it and draw it away from God, just like Paul did. It's worth saying that those who put away a good conscience, guys, will soon make shipwreck of their faith. Matter of fact, 1 Timothy 1.9 says this, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. I don't know about you. I don't want to make shipwreck. You know, I've been at this now 36 years, you know, and it took me one time four months to get back to God. I backslid for seven. And I don't want to, I don't want to make shipwreck now, you know. So it's in the heart that all the backsliding begins. It's not in the exterior Christianity. It's all in the heart. You might ask, Brother Paul, how do I gauge what's going on me, going on the inside of me? Let me put this chair up. You know, how can I, how can I gauge what's going on in my heart? You know, if you've got that question, uh, and if you want to know the answer to that question, I'm going to say to you right now, that's a good question. And here's the way that I do it. Here's the gauge that I use. You can ask yourself, look at your affections real closely. Are they, uh, are they going closer to the things of the world or your affections being drawn closer to your heavenly father? That's for one. Are you uh, experiencing more profit and pleasure in reading God's word? Or when you read it, do you feel like you're just discharging a duty? What about prayer? Are you experiencing a greater liberty than ever before in pouring your heart out to God? Or do you find it difficult to find words to say or how to approach him or just uncomfortable in the whole situation? Is your faith alive and building and expressing itself and building itself up on all the promises of God? What about your hope? Is it lively? Do you see a a very hopeful and future, a very glorious future in, in store for you, or are you without hope at all? You know, these are some of the ga gauges that you can ask yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. You see, to keep the heart means to store it with good and pure and holy things. Some of you heard me say this before. You know, the best way to get a child to lay down something that's dirty and nasty that would hurt him is to put something in front of him that's more lovely and pure and enticing to get him to drop the things that could hurt him. Notice this in the order of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 8. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. He said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise in those things, think on those things. So the heart that casts all its care upon God Casting all your cares upon him is a heart that is well guarded from anxiety by his grace and by his peace. But what I'm trying to say is still you have to have a pure atmosphere and the right things coming in to maintain the condition of that heart. So I'm going to wind up. I'm going to say this tonight to you. 
if you're getting the wrong results in your life, then, then what you're saying is wrong. If what you're saying is wrong, then what you're believing is wrong. If what you're believing is wrong, then what you're thinking on is wrong. And if what you're thinking on is wrong, then what you're eating spiritually and mentally is wrong. And if you want to have a greater walk with God, then you need to change the things that you're eating spiritually and mentally to change the whole process. I've been known to say this many, many times. The you where you're at because of the words that you've spoken in the past. And you're going to go and be where you're going to be by the words that you speak today. If you want a greater walk with your heavenly father, then what we need to do is, is make our hearts better. It sounds simple, but you have to be very, very diligent about it. Unfortunately, most Christians tend to work guys for some type of instant gratification or things which bring instant and quick results. I call that the God of convenience. You guys hear me talk about it all the time. What this is. That's Chase. Hey, brother Chase. Glad to see you there, Mr. Evangelist. So we have a tendency to work for that rather than long-lasting eternal effects in our lives. And I'm going to close with this statement, this little three paragraphs here. You know, we... We look after our bodies, we look after our clothes, our health, our possessions, our finances, our families. We wouldn't even give it a second thought, or I wouldn't, if a thief or a stranger came to endanger my body, my clothes, my possessions, my health, my family, my finances. I wouldn't give it a second thought to take action to keep that thief or stranger from doing any harm to all any of my possessions, my wife, my grandchildren, my money. What about our hearts? What about guilt, offenses, lust, pride, envy, covetedness? What about if those things try to enter and take place in your heart? They don't belong there. You see, this is the great work of Christians and Christian men especially, that we're appointed to, to do day in and day out is to guard a heart. For it's the heart of man that God's looking at. God does not look on the outside of men like men do, but he looks on the heart. It's in the heart that God moves and causes corresponding action. It's in the heart of men that God speaks strength and peace and deposits all his attributes. It's in the heart of men where the kingdom of God is planted, it's within that kingdom that God rules and reigns. So keep your heart, guys, with all diligence. Never a day off, for out of that come the issues of life. Not out of your circumstances. Not out of your situations. Not out of what's going on in the world. Not out of the political scene. Not out of uh, any outside sources, but all the issues of your life come out of your heart. So from here, since you know how important it is, we're going to talk about something next time, probably like this. What does it look like to guard your heart? What does that mean I'm doing when I'm fully guarding my heart? We're going to talk about that next time. And as we draw closer to God, you're going to have a much greater walk with your heavenly father. And you're going to see things that you've never seen before. You're going to hear things that you've never heard before. And God's going to be glorified and you're going to be benefited because, you know, there's not a promise that's no. Every one of them are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. We just need to make our hearts better. God bless you guys. Thank you for sticking with me. It's almost been 40 minutes, the longest we've ever gone, but this is a very, very important subject. So I bless you in Jesus' name, and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday, and we're going to talk about what it looks like when we guard our heart. God bless you. Have a good evening.